grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our sermon is the Gospel lesson that we continue our readings from the Gospel of St. Matthew. This morning we read in chapter 16, beginning at verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. This is God's word. In the name of Jesus Christ, who is the Lord, our God. Dear friends, our Savior masterfully leads his disciples to confirm their belief in him. Theirs is a confident confession of happiness, which is really what blessed means, and strength. Unlike the masses around them who held a variety of views and opinions about who Jesus is, his disciples believed, as God had given them the knowledge, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So it is with us. We have heard Jesus' word in the Bible. We have seen his miracles. By the power of the Spirit, God has convinced us of the identification of Jesus. People hold a variety of views and opinions about who Jesus is around us today also. But we, like Peter, as he speaks as the representative of disciples for all time, happily, blessedly, and in strength, confess who Jesus really is. And it is on Jesus, the rock, that God builds his church. And so this morning, once again, we are happy and strong in our faith because our blessed happiness and strength rests on God's Son. This Word of God is so full of things, one hardly knows where to begin. So, we'll look at three different aspects of that blessedness and strength we have as we rest on the rock of God's Son. The first one is that not every opinion about who Jesus is, is valid. And secondly, that the authority of the church doesn't lie in men, but it lies in God's Word. And finally, the real authority or the goal and work of the church is forgiving and retaining sins. Jesus was with his disciples up north near the city of Caesarea Philippi in Galilee. And you can tell by the name, which really means Caesar Philip, or ruler Philip, that it was a very Gentile area. And the power and the wealth of that city was having its effect also on the Jews who lived up there. It really sort of fanned the flame of their idea of the Messiah 
as being a king who would come and give Israel back the power and the wealth by taking it away from the Romans. And so it was a good place and a good time for Jesus to get his disciples to really think about who he is and what their confession of who he is would be. This is also important because this really is the starting point of when Jesus begins to teach his disciples that he would have to go and as the Messiah to suffer and to die on the cross. So it was very important that they knew who he really is to judge what he would do rightly. Jesus asked his followers a direct question. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Jesus uses here the most common designation that he uses for himself, the Son of Man. And in that expression is everything that he is and has come to do also as the Son of God. He came into the flesh and became a true human being. He wasn't just outwardly masquerading as a man. He took a real human nature into himself. And in that human nature, born of a woman, born under the law, he would obey the law and keep it perfectly for us. And then, because he was a true son of man, he could suffer and would suffer and die on the cross under God's wrath and punishment as our substitute. Jesus loved to call himself the Son of Man because it really expressed his mission and what he would do for us. Jesus knew that there were other opinions about who he was, but he wanted to hear it from his disciples so they'd think about it. Doesn't this remind us a little bit about the feeding of the 5,000 when Jesus, who knew where he was going to get enough food, said to them, where in the world are we going to get enough food to feed all these people? So they go, oh, yeah, well, Jesus could do that. Or, well, there's not enough food all around to do that. So now they were going to think a little bit about what other people were saying and what they were hearing. Some people said that he was John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Or that he was the prophet Elijah, reincarnated. Or maybe Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. But in every one of those cases, in all those other views and opinions, not one of them was that Jesus is the Son of Man, whom the prophet Daniel said was going to come into the world as the Savior, as the Redeemer. There are many views and opinions about Jesus today. And like those false opinions about Jesus, not every opinion about Jesus today is valid. When somebody says, I believe in Jesus, you really need to ask a few more searching questions about who they think that he is. Here are some false opinions about Jesus. That Jesus did not exist until he was conceived in Mary's womb. He was conceived in Mary's womb because he had an earthly human father. Or Jesus' body is still dust in some grave outside of Jerusalem. Or Jesus was a great teacher and is a great example of how to live, but he is really nothing more. Those are a few of the false views and opinions that are held by people about Jesus today. Not one of those opinions includes the real Jesus, the Son of Man, God who became flesh for his perfect act of obedience 
and a satisfactory passive obedience. The confession that Peter made, he made as representative of all those disciples then and for us. The confession that you and I just made in the Apostles' Creed echoes Peter's confession, doesn't it? It says of Jesus, what do we believe? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the eternal Son of God. You existed before you became Jesus in Mary's womb. You didn't have a human father. You are, you are conceived by the Holy Spirit. Your body lives and reigns and fills all things for the good of the church. You are my teacher. You are my example. But most of all, you are my Savior. You are my Redeemer from sin. You are true God and true man. Our happiness or our blessedness and our strength rests on that rock. Rests on Jesus Christ. The bedrock on which the church builds. The other day we were watching a television program about the rebuilding, you might have seen it, of the World Trade Center, the new one. And how they dug all the way down to the solid bedrock in order to set that foundation for the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere. It is in this text you are aware that there are some other false opinions and views about Jesus. Peter was already Petrus the stone. Christ did not build his church on Peter. It's a false view and opinion of Jesus that he established his church on the man Peter and in all the men who follow him in a particular office. Christ did not establish his church on apostolic succession. He did not establish it on tradition. He did not establish it on church councils. And he certainly didn't establish it on one human being as the head of all Christendom. Jesus Christ establishes His church and the authority of that church is not a man. It's not tradition. It's not councils. It is only the word of God. The real authority in the church is God's word. Peter and we do not have our convictions of Jesus in our hearts and minds because some human being convinced us of that. We don't build on Christ as the rock because we convinced ourselves that he is the Savior and made a decision then to believe. We have our truth on Jesus Christ the same way Peter did. Jesus says, Peter, you're blessed. You're happy in your faith. You're strong in your faith because you know it didn't depend on you. Your Father in heaven revealed it to you in God's Word. And the Holy Spirit, through that Word, gave you that conviction. And that's why you are blessed, happy, in the purest spiritual sense. And that is why we are blessed. That's why we are strong in our faith. Because the Father in heaven, our Father in heaven, has brought us to this conviction. Jesus Christ, the real Jesus Christ, revealed in the scripture is the solid rock on which the church stands. And even though steeples are falling, we still believe in him. I re-mention this because at conference last week, uh, the pastor from Crete, Illinois, or rather Grant Park, Illinois, uh, had this congregation, had this hymn come to life as in the last windstorm their steeple fell off their church. But he made the point, well, even though the steeple fell, we still build on Christ, the rock. And we're still there, we're still standing, we're still built on our Savior. And we know 
that the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, will not overcome it. Gates is a metaphor for power. Jesus says, because I build my church on me, on Christ, and on the object of Peter's confession, which is Christ, that all the power of the spiritual kingdoms, all the power of men's earthly kingdoms have been destroyed and have been counteracted and will never be able to destroy the church. We are the direct beneficiaries of that because of, as we think a month ahead, because of the Lutheran Reformation. Luther built his beliefs on the authority of God's word. We build our faith not on Luther, but on the authority of God's word. Peter confessed the truth of Christ because he was an apostle. We confess the truth of Christ in the Apostles' Creed because our confession is the same as his and the other apostles. Our blessed happiness and strength rests only on God's Son. And that authority of God's Son comes to us in the Word. And that Word enables us to carry out our work and our goal And that is to forgive and to retain sins. Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. No human being can bind a person in their sins. No human being by their own power can forgive a person their sins. That authority comes from Christ. And Christ gave that authority to his church. Remember we learned that in catechism? The ministry of the keys? And none of us understood what that even meant. Until the pastor explained to us, it's using the gospel. When a Christian is sinned against, we go to that person and we say, I forgive you. You and I confessed our sins this morning. And as your public representative, as Christ's public representative, I absolved us of our sins through the gospel. That's the ministry of the keys. You and I, as individual Christians, not as priests, not as human beings, not as members of a council, not as followers of a certain tradition, but as Christians, each have that authority and the power to forgive sins. We also have that power to retain sins. When a person mocks forgiveness, when a person rejects forgiveness because of impenitence and unbelief, each and every one of us as Christians can warn that person, as long as you are impenitent for that sin, you won't be saved. You are outside of the body of Christ. And finally, the church, not the pastor, but the church, joining together, acknowledging that person's impenitence, can retain that person's sins through excommunication and declares that person to be apart from the body of Christ. And when, God willing, that person repents and acknowledges their sin, then there we are right away again with that key to forgive a person for all their sins. But you and I, either individually or as a congregation, don't do that by our own power. We do it because our happiness and strength rests on God's Son. And it is the authority that God's Son gives us to do that. And so it is really He, through the Gospel, that does those things. Jesus' final command to them might seem a bit odd at first. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. I thought we were supposed to tell everybody that Jesus is the Christ. But what Jesus was telling them was, I don't want you going around saying who I am without the supporting evidence 
that I'm going to give you. And so that you can also see the result of that after my resurrection. He didn't just want them going around saying Jesus is the Christ so that people could draw all kinds of false views and opinions about what that means. And that's true also for us. We tell people that Jesus is the Christ, but then with the word of God, we tell them who he is. We reveal him to us. We share his miracles. We share his word. So that the Holy Spirit can work that knowledge, so that the Father can work that knowledge through the Holy Spirit. So there isn't just a saying that Jesus is someone, but then there is a surrounding supporting evidence of his suffering and his death and his resurrection. And that way, you and I make clear, amidst the din of all the false opinions about who Jesus is, where real authority lies, what rights the church really has by itself or not, which are none, they all come through Christ as we go out into the world. And so, when you witness, begin with this question. Who do you say Jesus is? And then, in your blessed happiness and strength, confess the Son of Man, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen.